Welcome, everybody. It's Monday, November 24th, 2014. And I'm very pleased to welcome back to the program Gary Chartier. We've had Gary on in the past to talk about uh, several topics, including two of his books. We've talked about Radicalizing Rawls and his book, The Conscience of an Anarchist. Well, today he's going to talk to us about themes in his very important work, Anarchy and Legal Order, Law and Politics for a Stateless Society. Gary Chartier is a professor of law and business ethics and associate dean at the business school at La Sierra University in Riverside, California. He holds a JD from UCLA and his PhD from Cambridge University. Gary, welcome back to the show. It's awesome to be with you, Tom. Gary, we, I haven't had you on in a long time, and the main reason is this book I want to talk to you about is, is a bear, not in the sense that it's hard to read or it's complicated. It's, it's long, and it's, it, it's long in the sense that it's packed with information. It's, one of, it's not one of these breezy books that you can skip 30 pages and feel like you didn't lose anything. This is an extremely systematic presentation of a difficult argument to make, frankly. And I wanted to I want to do this thing justice, and we may not be able to do it justice in just one episode. I want to start off by asking you, this topic of anarchy and the law, which is the title of your book, has been covered by a number of people. Now, certainly, there is a vast amount of work to be done in this area. It's still very much virgin territory. But I do want to know, in your estimation, where do you think your contributions are? Not, you don't have to give us the specifics, but in what areas of this question do you think you're bringing something new to the table? Well, so a lot of modern kind of market anarchist, market libertarian theory in the last 50 to 100 years has been rooted broadly in natural law thinking. But there are different strands of natural law thinking, and what I've tried to do in this book is to ask whether one particularly, I think, interesting and sophisticated version of contemporary natural law theory, a version that is often associated in the minds of its opponents and uh, indeed uh, readers as well, with uh, a pretty conventionally statist approach, could be recast to provide a grounding for a full-blown libertarian anarchist position. What would it take to do that? So this book attempts to build on one particular strand then of natural law thinking, uh, one that runs from Aristotle to Aquinas through to contemporary figures like Germain Grisé and John Finnis, and ask what a version of that theory that provided a solid grounding for a free society might actually look like. That's probably the most significant contribution the book makes, though I hope it does some other things as well. Well, in, I guess, Chapter 3, you make a case that, of course, we need the some of the goods, anyway, that the state provides. We don't deny that we need them. But we do need law, and we do need security. But in Chapter 3, you give reasons that we should rule out the state as the institution providing these services. Now, this is this is easy for a libertarian to understand, but all the same, what's the general gist of your argument? And, and incidentally, I should point out to people, this book is published by, is it Cambridge University Press? Cambridge, yeah. So, so it's not our usual audience, necessarily. So you do have to, you do have to review arguments that might be familiar to listeners of this program uh, when you're dealing with an audience, an academic audience at that level. Yeah, so the argument in Chapter 3 uh, is the uh, the crucial argument for, for anarchy. So in the previous chapter, Chapter 2, I have used the resources of the natural law approach I'm exploring and defending to ground a robust account of property rights. Uh, the uh, natural law approach tends to be favorable to property rights, but its proponents often have seen those rights as a lot more malleable and a lot more subject to interference than I think that we ought to see them as being. So I try to show how within the terms of that theory, one can adduce reasons for robust property rights. Once I've done that, I can then go on to uh, the next chapter, to chapter three, um, building on an understanding of property rights as grounded in natural law theory. Then we can see how states 
interfere with those property rights, and that's certainly one reason why we ought to be uh, suspicious of states. There's systematic interference with property rights, but also, I suggest, a whole range of other reasons uh, that have to do with the way in which states are predictably and persistently rapacious and exploitative. Uh, I look at the history of uh, uh, state power, not in a detailed way, certainly not in a way that would do justice to what you as a historian would uh, would want, but I at least try to survey some issues there. And I talk about the reasons that we might draw from resources like uh, game theory and economics and social psychology for expecting that people could, in fact, maintain social order on their own without the aid of Leviathan, without the aid of some top-down uh, controller. So Chapter 3 is packed in with uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, we begin with a presumption against interference with the property rights we said in the previous chapter, show that states do this, and show that states aren't needed to do the things that their proponents think they're needed to do, and therefore that uh, interference isn't justified. Uh, so that's, I guess, a short version of what is, as you point out, a fairly long chapter. Gary, just to whet the appetites of the listeners, I actually want to read the subheadings of this chapter because they are so provocative that you, you want to drop everything and go go read it. Uh, uh, going from numbers one through seven, the state is inimical to peaceful, voluntary cooperation. And then Gary elaborates on that. Peaceful, voluntary cooperation is an aspect of and a crucial precondition for a flourishing life. Then... State actors' refusal to cooperate with others on a peaceful, voluntary basis is highly problematic. Then, the state is not needed to ensure peaceful, voluntary cooperation. Then, the state is not needed to ensure peaceful, voluntary cooperation in the production of crucial public goods. Then, the state is dangerous, and then embracing peaceful, voluntary cooperation means rejecting the state, uh, and then followed by an appendix. You have a section in Chapter 4, Legal codes in a stateless society would have varied sources and contents, but might exhibit common features. I want to talk about this, because it's hard for people to imagine law without the state. And at least one of the reasons is that it seems that different peoples would give rise to different codes of law that might be incompatible with one another. Now, part of the answer to that would be you already live in a system like that. People live in different jurisdictions, and they're subject to different kinds of law, but what we would be proposing here would be not geographically based, but it would be based, it would still be a system, though, that uh, in which people might live under different sorts of legal arrangements. The question I have for you is one that's always bugged me about this, which is people sure. have completely different first principles. Uh, a, a lot of times you'll have people, well, people like us, for example, we believe in private property rights, but there could be other people in some aspects of the socialist tradition who would reject all property. Let's imagine the most radical anti-property people. How could peoples living under those two completely different approaches to understanding life and property live together in peace side by side? It seems to be taken for granted in libertarian and anarcho-capitalist, or I'm sorry, I know you don't like that term, but in anarchist analyses of this, yeah, that's a, I have to have you on for another show for that, but it's, it's sure. like they take for granted that, well, somehow it'll all work out that it's libertarian. But these people are not going to abide by that. How could I have a legal case against somebody who doesn't think he's trespassing on my property because he doesn't accept the same first principles I do? You see what I'm driving at? Absolutely, Tom. And uh, I do think that uh, that's one of the... Um it's one of the biggest challenges that any anarchist model faces, whether it's a market anarchist model that takes property rights seriously or any number of other anarchist models. Anarchists of all sorts recognize the variety, the diversity of people's commitments and preferences, and uh, the question then becomes how those might be coordinated. And... Um, it's tempting to be snarky here, right, to think of that uh, infamous cartoon that uh, uh, shows the uh, enormous uh, uh, equation drawn out on a blackboard by the uh, the scientist, and then at one point you see, and then a miracle occurs. <laughs> right. uh, and and uh, I do find sometimes that uh, uh, libertarians talking about this will say, in effect, well, the foundation of the society will be everybody gets together and agrees on a basic set of rules. And 
one wants to say, well, that would be wonderful, but it hardly seems likely. So what that means, I think, is that unavoidably a free society is a work in progress. Uh, you'd like to think that um, good rules, rules that commend themselves to, uh, to reason, rules that uh, can, in fact, uh, help to maintain social order across uh, diverse groups, you know, will tend to commend themselves to uh, the people's uh, reflection. But we obviously recognize that uh, it's not always that simple. The model that I want to defend here is not one that assumes that everyone in the society will embrace all of my arguments for uh, robust property rights and protections against torture and violence and so forth, the underlying commitment to non-aggression that I seek to elaborate and defend in the book. Uh, I hope people will, and I'd like to think that uh, sensible legal codes will embody those rules. I recognize that's not always going to be the case. So what I think instead uh, we have to assume is that even when people don't share underlying commitments, uh, one thing that they are likely to share is a desire, if possible, to cooperate and avoid violence. Now, we can't guarantee that that will be true for everyone, but it seems likely that we can count on a modicum of agreement between the different organizations and associations and so forth that promote uh, dispute resolution, even if their members don't, in fact, always embrace the same uh, uh, ideological commitment, because those associations themselves will want to avoid violence. Violence is costly on multiple levels, and they'll want to craft agreements with each other that will enable them to protect their members at at minimal cost, and cost here need not the, the language, using the language of cost need not imply that all of these are commercial. As you point out, there might well be groups uh, that really would be anti-commercial. Nonetheless, those groups still don't are still aren't going to want violence, still aren't going to want to be involved in violent conflict over uh, uh, various issues. And so, I think the we can't expect perfect solutions. We can't expect plea agreement, but we can hope for two things: that different. Uh, we can broadly say protective associations will tend to want to craft agreements with each other relating to conflicts between their members that will minimize violence, and that for reasons of efficiency, there will be a measure of convergence on similar rules. Uh, it's not perfect, but I think uh, it is an approach that will tend to reduce costs and minimize uh, and minimize conflict to a significant extent, and then leave room for peaceful advocacy. Uh, we hope to uh, uh, lead people to increasingly commit uh, to what uh, I would regard as, as sensible rules. Can't guarantee that at all, but I think we can expect conflict reducing and violence reducing if you get back to action. All right, let's go to an even more fundamental question. Where is law coming from in the absence of the state? Well, so it's a good question, Tom. And when people ask the question that way, they often seem to be presupposing a kind of positivist view. They assume that uh, law, normative law, law that actually engages our loyalty, is law that comes from the command of a sovereign. Obviously, sociologically, positivism might well be right. That is, states create things that they call laws and they enforce them at gunpoint. But if we're going to talk about what's actually um, a reasonable source of maintaining order, uh, there's no reason to think that law has to come from uh, the, uh, the command of uh, an arbitrary authority from Hobbes' Leviathan. Uh, the model that I'm working with is a kind of two-stage model. So, first of all, there is natural law. That is, there are underlying normative principles that apply across a range of situations that are rooted in the way human beings are put together, that are rooted in kind of what is needed for humans to flourish, for human lives to go well. and uh, so these natural law principles uh, provide a kind of bedrock moral grounding for just law. We recognize that uh, 
uh, that foundation isn't going to be acknowledged by everyone, but that at any rate is a key source of law for people to recognize it. Then on top of that, uh, we have reason, I think, in terms of the natural law principles I elaborate, to favor the imposition of authority in virtue of consent. And so when people can consent to associate in particular ways, they can also consent to uh, various kinds of rules as operative within the particular association they form. So we can imagine then uh, both the kind of general principles, which uh, are the sorts of things on which I hope these different uh, associations might converge, which would turn out to be, I think, the, the basic principles of, of the natural law, and then various consensual principles, part of the more particular legal uh, regimes that would uh, govern uh, interactions in particular contexts and would be consent-based. So I don't need to consent to a rule that I not murder or torture you, but I might well need to consent to some rule, let us say, for instance, about um, you know the uh, abandonment of a piece of property or the formalization of a contract. And uh, different uh, different legal regimes would, uh, it seems to me, uh, formulate and implement those kinds of rules. So I think law would come both from the natural law and from the consent of individual participants in varying systems. I'm very interested, of course, in the enforcement of law. This is also tricky for people to see. You have a section, a regime could forcibly resolve conflicts without laws without becoming morally indistinguishable from a state. Now, Bob Murphy, whom, as you know, has, who, as you know, has written about these topics, yes. has suggested that, or has posited a, a, a theory in which there would not necessarily need to be violence exerted against an outlaw, because what would happen is that nobody would be willing to do business with this person, and there might be isolated pockets where people will say, you can come onto our property and get your life together and maybe do some remunerative work because no one else will take uh -huh. you. And so they'll voluntarily segregate themselves from the rest of society until such time as society is ready to take them back. I, I'm not sure I'm completely convinced of that. What is your mechanism? And I know Bob listens every day, so I don't know what's going to happen now, but uh, what's your approach to this question? So... I, uh, I'm very fond of uh, Bob's work in chaos theory, and I, and I believe I cited it at uh, a couple of points in the book. I think Bob, uh, Bob does some great stuff there. Um, but the model you've just described, uh, which involves, for instance, exclusion, uh, is still one that's necessarily, at least in principle, uh, going to be backed up by force, right? I mean, if uh, uh, the... Uh, Outlaws uh, uh, you were just talking about do want to enter people's property, and uh, those people regard them as not safe. I mean, Bob, uh, as I recall, talks about the importance of people being bonded or having having you know basically insurance backup, not having that uh, when there are people who have histories of, of violence and rapacity. Um, and so, because they lack that uh, surety, uh, they're not able. Uh, per the property owner's uh, wishes to enter the property, obviously uh, that's not self-enforcing. Uh, and it's not enforcing, it's enforceable just in virtue of the, uh, the goodwill of the outlaw. If the outlaw had the goodwill to avoid uh, uh, entering the people's property without their consent, uh, probably that person would be an outlaw in the first place. So I think that uh, we are still talking about a model, uh, even uh, as, as Bob has laid it out, in which, uh, in which there is the uh, potential threat of force to uh, restrain or exclude people, uh, right? I don't think uh, uh, that uh, consideration goes away. Uh, what I think Bob has really offered is a model uh, in particular that might help us see alternatives to imprisonment, and I think that's marvelous. Well, I, yeah, you know, that, that's a better description uh, of it. That's right. Yeah, uh, it's not a, it's not an alternative to enforcement. It's not the force is still there, but uh, it may be that uh, voluntary segregation can happen without uh, without imprisonment. My view is that uh, somebody who is reasonably judged to be engaged in an ongoing 
kind of program or campaign of violence. Um, it can be, if necessary, forcibly restrained in the same way that one might imagine a combatant uh, who has uh, laid down his or her arms being restrained in wartime. And so I think that in such cases, and I don't try to spell out just when that would be, uh, it's not unreasonable uh, to think that in a very free society, we still could, if necessary, uh, employ something that might seem closer to conventional imprisonment for some people. But I'd much prefer Bob's model, right? I think I think prison's bad news for everybody. Uh, it uh, creates bad incentives. It creates bad character traits. And the kind of voluntary self-segregation uh, created by the existence of a network of, of property rights uh, that allow the exclusion of potentially violent uh, that Bob talks about, I think, is, is great. And I'd certainly prefer that uh, all around. Um, I'm not sure if I've gotten at everything you were asking. No, that's no, really that's good. That's good. Now, I, I'm I'm also curious about. Again, it really comes down to your your views of property because I could see somebody who is an anti who is opposed to property rights to one degree or another, thinking right. that the regime you're describing is not in its fundamentals different from a state because they think of the state as being an enforcement mechanism for private property. Well, now you are just taking that and putting a little exponent next to it. They would view it, I think, as somewhat indistinguishable. But you're saying here that there are key aspects in which the two are morally distinguishable. Right. So, unavoidably, um, we have to do some moral state work here, right? Um, I begin with the view, and I don't just posit it, I devote you know, the, in a better part of a hundred pages to arguing for it, um, in chapter two, uh, I begin with the view that natural law theory grounds robust property rights, which are separate from, distinguishable from, independent of state action. Okay? So, if I'm right about that, then um, property rights uh, can be understood to be independent of the state, and an entity which defends those property rights is defending natural rights in much the same way that it would be if it were defending people against bodily assault. Um, it's worth noting, by the way, here, uh, when my book, The Conscience of an Anarchist, came out, I did an interview um, several years ago with an anarcho-communist uh, group uh, that uh, had found the book interesting and wanted to talk about it. And one thing I found um, intriguing about that, uh, because it's, the anarcho-communist literature, unfortunately, is not a literature I know as well as I might like to. Uh, and so I was interested that these guys were very quick to say, look, uh, we've got problems with property, but those problems with property are not problems with the possession, this is my language, not theirs, but with the possession of those resources that people need for the ongoing uh, operation of their lives. So their account of possessory claims definitely didn't involve people uh, being excluded from their own homes and uh, not having the tools they needed to work and so forth. So I'm not sure, just because of the sheer essential practicality of giving people responsibility for particular things, that the gap between narco-communists and other kinds of market anarchists would necessarily be as great as we're uh, sometimes perhaps concerned that it might be. But in any event... Um, I'm making a normative argument in the book that there are basic uh, natural uh, rights claims to uh, the, the property, and that an entity which defends those, therefore, is morally reasonable and isn't state-like, uh, just like an entity that defends people's bodies against violence is morally reasonable and isn't state-like. The state acts contrary to people's consent, controlling their bodies and their labor and their property without their, without that consent. And what I try to show is that the basic legal rules and legal regimes in a free society could operate with consent. Uh, the, the one qualifier being you don't need consent to enforce basic moral rules. 
So that's that's the way I would uh, make the distinction. Well, sometime in the future, I want to have you come on and talk about your exposition of natural law theory and what it has to say to us about property. That would make an interesting conversation in and of itself. I do want to do that, and I do want to hit on a few other topics in this book at some point in the future. But before I let you go today, the the question that would still be in people's minds, and of course I urge people just read the book, of course. It's a, it's a detailed argument. It's systematic. It's provocative. You're not going to be bored reading it, that's for sure. The book is Anarchy and Legal Order. How in a given case, would a stateless approach to dispute resolution handle uh, just a simple case of theft or anything else where it seems that we would have to force the parties into the courtroom and we would have to have some political appointee decide who's in the right and who's in the wrong, and we've got to, and, and then we have to force people to come and sit and hear the case uh, for $40 a day or whatever the going rate is. What's different in the regime you're envisioning? Well, so fundamentally, a consent-based regime is going, I trust, to build in uh, incentives uh, for for cooperation, right? So uh, all of us need help resolving disputes. We all either intentionally or inadvertently bump up against the boundaries of other people's claims, however those claims are defined, whatever they are. And so each of us has an incentive to find ways of resolving disputes peacefully and efficiently. Uh, I suggest that a fairly straightforward way of thinking about this, one that's been worked out by economists and political theorists uh, for some time, involves people affiliating with each other in one way or another. I talk in general terms about legal regimes uh, because what I envision would be a whole set of uh, uh, different sorts of associations people might have. Some of them might be purely uh, bottom-up uh, voluntary clubs, in effect, in which people would get together to uh, cooperate uh, with each other uh, in uh, uh, funding and sustaining dispute resolution institutions. Some might instead build on existing uh, legal codes. Think about rabbinical law or canon law in the Catholic Church. We can imagine uh, those being extended in various ways and people affiliating with uh, entities that uh, lay those out and making those their, their primary uh, uh, homes in terms of the law. But in any event, people are going to want to cooperate and affiliate with each other to uh, uh, resolve uh, resolve disputes about fundamental uh, matters that uh, might otherwise prompt forcible conflict. So, um, suppose, for instance, you talk about a case of theft. Uh, I uh, I walk off with your wallet. So, at that point, the presuming, and this is uh, an issue, obviously, that raises other complications, but presuming you uh, are able to identify me as the uh, as the thief, the thief, and you want to uh, both get the wallet back and then also, of course, be compensated for your time and trouble in doing that. Uh, you're not made whole if you just get the wallet back. You certainly also need compensation for the it's incidental. Um, you now want to initiate a, uh, a legal case against me. Well, uh, the simplest option uh, to consider is one in which you and I are participants in the same legal regime. Um, so I've already consented to the jurisdiction of that, that regime by being a member, and not only have I consented so that there's some kind of moral obligation on me to cooperate, but also I want the defense of that regime, I want it to support me, and uh, if I decline to cooperate with it, uh, it may well be that I'll forfeit its protection. Certainly, I'll also forfeit any credibility I might have in dealing with anyone else uh, where the issue of my having the support of any legal regime is uh, an issue. So I've certainly got some incentive to participate. Uh, if I don't participate, of course, in this legal case against me, I might simply be the victim of default judgment. I probably don't want that either. Uh, but if I am the default judgment, then of course, the regime's going to be entitled to uh, claim resources from me uh, as needed to, uh, to satisfy that judgment. Well, so 
suppose then, by contrast, I'm a member of another legal regime, a uh, participant in, in some other legal regime rather than uh, in yours. Well, at that point, um, again, you're going to want to uh, mount a, uh, a case against me for the same kind of compensation. Uh, but at that point, an agreement probably between my uh, legal regime and your legal regime would kick in, one that would govern cross-regime disputes. And again, regimes would have uh, reason to want to make resolution of those disputes as simple as possible, but they're going to want to avoid violence and enhance their own credibility. Uh, some critics of uh, this sort of approach, uh, famously Ayn Rand, seem to think that uh, the regimes are going to want to shoot it out. But it seems fairly clear that uh, regimes are long-term players. They're not going to want to engage in violence, both because of the reputational problems involved and because of the cost involved, uh, even if they are utterly uh, amoral. And obviously, if they have moral constraints, all the more reason why that wouldn't be the case. So the regimes will want to facilitate conflict resolution. Again, will want to assert jurisdiction over the respective members and uh, bring them into a situation in which uh, which the conflict can be resolved. And again, if I get judgment against you, uh, your, or you get a judgment against me, rather, my regime uh, is going to have good reason to want to assist your regime in enforcing that judgment against me. So um, it gets complicated, and we can talk about all the various, various features of, of the system, but the bottom line, I think, is that both... Uh, normative constraints and uh, a variety of efficiency and related constraints are going to dispose people to cooperate with each other within legal reason. Well, Gary, there's so many other topics we can hit on, and I'd like to do that with you at some point in the future. But for now, uh, let I want to urge people that if this topic is one that holds some interest for you, and I know for a lot of you it does, uh, a lot of us uh, think about stuff like this all the time, actually, then the book to read is Anarchy and Legal Order, and the subtitle is Law and Politics for a Stateless Society. By our guest today, Gary Chartier. Gary, as always, we enjoy uh, talking to you and learning from you, and we'll have to do it again soon. Look forward to it, Tom. All right, everybody, a couple quick things before I let you run. I've got a few dates to run by you. I'm going to be in Houston January 24th. Remember, it's the Mises Circle in Houston. Lou Rockwell, Ron Paul, Jeff Dice, and I will be speaking there. It's always a great time. Then in February, it looks like we are nailing down an event at Florida Atlantic University. I'll be able to give you more details on that soon. Then April, I realize this is far in the future, but it's one of these save-the-date things. April 9th, I'll be at American University in, I think that's in Washington, D.C. proper. It may I don't know for sure. I've never been there, but it's certainly in the D.C. area anyway. Then April, the weekend of the 24th, 25th, I'll be in Montreal for personal reasons, but I believe Mises Canada is going to help me put on a at least a little event, maybe a lunchtime event on that Saturday. Then in May, May 22nd, I'm having an event in Dublin, Ireland, and if you are in Ireland, please drop me a note via the contact page at tomwoods.com so I can put you on my, my little list to update you on the details of that event. It won't be a list that I'll use for any other purpose. Just if you happen to live there, I will send you a note to let you know what's going on with that. Remember, too, that my new book is available. It's it's called, what is it called? It's called Real Dissent, of course. A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. Check it out at realdissent.com. If you're listening to and enjoying this program, this book is for you. And, of course, you can get a free audiobook version of the book with me reading it at TomWoodsAudio.com. We won't be having a program on Thanksgiving Day, but we'll have a program every weekday this week except Thursday. So I hope you'll keep on tuning in and subscribing on iTunes or Stitcher to The Tom Woods Show. Thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.